Hello. June is Black Music Month, and that's a time to celebrate the contributions that African American musicians, composers, singers, and songwriters have made to American culture. All month long, we have highlighted the unique impact that Detroit has had on some of America's most popular genres. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into those genres and talk to the people influential in making that Detroit sound mainstream. Gospel music is music that you can feel, and you can't talk about gospel music without mentioning Detroit. From the powerful vamps of the iconic harmonies, Detroit style has become a staple in the genre. We talked to gospel music royalty Kiara Sheard about Detroit's impact on the genre and her family's unique connection. I'm a church girl, so church was in my weekly itinerary along with school, and um, I, I went to David Ellis Academy, I went to Bates Academy, um, and then uh, our church has always been in the city. Once upon a time, it was off the service drive of Southfield Freeway, and then Sturt Event in Highland, well, not, yeah, that's Detroit, okay. And then, um, what's the other part? And then we were in Bailey's Cathedral off of Livernois, so, and then we lived off of uh, Seven Mile and Outer Drive. So many great memories. How I got into gospel is really special. Of course, Detroit Bread has everything to do with Dr. Maddie Moss Clark and the Clark sisters. My mother is uh, Dr. Karen Clark Sheard, and my father is Bishop J. Drew Sheard. They are both great leaders in the city of Detroit. And um, the connection was I had an opportunity to debut on my mother's debut record. Um, and that's how it all began. My mom had me on the road with her since I was nine years old. My daughter, Kiara Sheard. The devil's loose in all the world. Yeah. My mom is my best friend. She's, she's beautiful. She's amazing. She shows me that you can go out and be a monster, like a beast on the stage, but I can still be graceful. She's like a quiet storm, if I can say that. But she's, she's taught me to not just get up there. And, we know you can sing, but get up there and say something. Like, people want to hear you sing, but... Let them leave with something. But I say it with total humility, you know, I, I really think that it is, I know it is a God-given thing and um, I'm so grateful to be a part of such a great legacy. Something that Detroit artists have when it comes to conviction, you can feel it, you can feel the soul. In addition to that, it's almost like they, you know how when somebody does like an acrobat or a run, it's like they, it can be never ending. <laughs> so um, it's so much I can say, um, but it's it, Detroit, whatever comes from Detroit and into gospel music, it, it definitely is a rich sound. Um, great vamps where you can just drive a song and just mm, tsh, 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 or it could be sweet mm, tsh, 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 tsh. Uh, um, and I think it it's like the the redundant thing where you just gotta repeat um, you got the Clark sisters hallelujah hallelujah the wine is it's time it's time to make that change so I could go on and on. You, you, you're getting me good, though, because I got to know my history. Um, so, yes, absolutely. I think that is the trend that has come from gospel music, where you work it and you still feel funky, but you still got, like, that gospel, you know, come, you hear the gospel, you hear the good news, you hear the message, you hear faith. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do. A lot of people can't get up and just work a song, you know, and still stay on course without singing bad notes and making sure you say things that make sense. My new album um, is so good. It's so good. My new album is All Yours, and All Yours comes from um, one of the songs on the record, which features Anthony Brown. So, of course, with God having his stamp on it and his leading, um, I worked with a lot of other producers and artists, artists who now, too, not just has my ear, but I have other ears, you know, who can kind of create that sound. Like, this is what they listen to, but you can put your twist on it this way. You know, so I think that, that co the collaborative effort has really um, cat catapulted um, my way of artistry in this space, in this season, and I'm proud about that. So I lift my hands as high. And 
I understand you wrote a book. Yes. So tell me please, what is that book about? It's called The Vibes You Feel, and um, it's, I think the subtitle, it, it is um, What the Holy Spirit Has Taught Me Through Relationships. And um, I'm a very vibe sensitive person. I love people. And I've had to learn over time to number one, not play victim, because sometimes we can be so heartbroken and be disappointed or have our expectations in people or expect ourselves out of people. And it's like, well, that was your fault. It wasn't their fault, you know? And sometimes we'll get these memos from the Holy Spirit or from God and we'll ignore them and you know sometimes when you get in your 30s you'll still be going through transitions of friendships and relationships and once upon a time I thought it was going to be done when we was in high school because you know we don't have the same friends but even in your 20s you still kind of go through a transition because you're learning more about yourself and one thing that I've learned is um, I had to stop playing victim and pointing the finger and saying that this person did this wrong or that person did this wrong and I had to acknowledge that you know hey uh, the vibe that you have to now accept about yourself is that you expect yourself out of people and you have to let people be people give them a chance to show who they are so that you can see the value that they bring who is the most influential person in your life as it relates to gospel music Music. Oh, my mommy. <laughs> my mommy, um, she's my best friend, so she's impacted my life. What an inspirational story, and I definitely know a little something about the power of following in your mother's footsteps. Coming up, we explore the deep moans, rhythms, and tempos that make the blues sound so iconic. Stay with us. Welcome back. The blues is often associated with sadness and pain, but Detroit's Queen of Blues says that this genre is so much more than that. Take a listen. My name is Thornetta Davis, and I am Detroit's Queen of the Blues. I've been singing blues in the city of Detroit for the last 30, 35, I say 30 plus. Uh, years. I went to Southeastern High School um, on the east side and uh, at that time we were surrounded by you know gangs and drugs and all kind of bad things but our neighborhood I was real sheltered. My mom kept me and my three sisters at our home. We didn't go out much you know much as possible. We played the radio, played records Dance. Me and my little my my uh, little sister and my older sister Karen. We would emulate the Jackson Fives when it was coming up, you know. And I was always a lead singer. I found out at 15 this is what I want to do. I was singing with a girl group called Chanteuse, and we were basically just trying to get on the scene. We didn't really have any gigs. We were young. I was a young mother, and uh, me and my girlfriends Roseanne and Rosemary Matthews were just doing little bars here and there. Wasn't even making enough to do anything with, maybe $50 to split between us. But at that time, I had met Dave McMurray, who was one of the top horn players in the city at the time. He was jamming with a group of guys called the Lamont Zodiac and the Love Signs. And they were playing at a club on the east side called the Red Carpet. And we all went down there and checked it out. And I did it so much, I loved it so much that I kept going back jamming. And next thing you know, um, I got asked by one of the members in the band, would I come and do a show with them at Alvin's one day? And I did. Um, next thing I know, I was asked to join the band. They said, we don't do top 40, which is what I was doing at the time. We do soul and blues. And so I said, okay. And I went and researched some music in my mom's record collection. And I started singing blues. But see, by me being the, the only sister at the time out, out here doing that kind of music with a group of white boys, that was different. And so that brought a, a, a special attention to what I was doing. And they started writing, me, writing about me in the newspaper and magazines and everything, and, and that was new for me. I've actually had people come and say to me, I, I used to didn't like the blues, but I like your blues, you know. People assume that blues is all about sad and low down and gut rucked and, you know, back in the fields. Some of it's like that, yes, and that's good too. But some music is meant to lift your spirits. And that's the reason why people sung the blues back then, 
because they couldn't do anything else. You know, they they being whipped and beat on, and if they if they can do nothing but let out a holler to release the pressure, that's what they were doing. I'm hoping that I've influenced young people to continue this music. I don't want it to disappear. I want people to understand that it's, especially young African-American people, it's our heritage. It comes from blood, sweat, and a whole lot of tears. And I don't want America to get this confused that this music is not just for African Americans to do. It's just that it came from us. And we have so many things that's been stripped stripped from our our legacy. I want to continue to honor it. And I want young African American musicians and singers to continue to honor this music. It's not old fashioned. It's not something to be kicked to the curb. You can incorporate it, listen to it, go out and get some Ma Rainey, some Bessie Smiths some muddy water, incorporate it into your, your artistry. It'll make you better. It made me better. I feel wonderful, I feel great, I feel honored, and I'm blessed, you know? And then I won an award for, for this. as my ninth nomination. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I haven't released an album since 2016, but I've been steadily gigging, doing more shows. And when I'm sitting there in the audience and they call out the category again, the, the feeling comes over you and you think, well, it's not happening this year either because you have to win the, the voters over. And a lot, not a lot of the, the voters, my fan base in Detroit, know anything about the Blues Foundation. And my husband, who's in the band, said, well, you've performed in front of all of them last year with all the different festivals that I did last year. They were there. And I still didn't believe it. And I'm sitting there going, okay, and I'm drinking my tea. And next thing you go, and the winner is Thornetta Davis. And I'm like, what? And I got my award. After the original Queen of the Blues, Alberta Adams, passed, a year later, the Blue Society asked me, would I be the queen? And they gave me a coronation and a crown. So I feel an obligation to represent Detroit City everywhere I go. So yeah, I'm honored. Well, there really is more to blues than what meets the eye, or rather the ear. Ahead, we introduce you to a native Detroiter breathing new life into classical music. Raised in Detroit's inner city, acclaimed piano prodigy Black Bach fuses his music and his identity. His name is even a nod to the great composer, and his style is a take, it takes elements from pop and hip hop culture. The neoclassical pianist uses his music to highlight relevant topics in society. Originally from Detroit, from the west side of Detroit, um, I went to school at for two years at Cass Tech and then two years at Detroit uh, School for Performing Arts. Um, I'm a neoclassical composer and musician. What was life like for you growing up on the West Side? Oh, it was pretty cool. It was a little bit different because um, at the time, from about age four to 16, I was a classical piano student. So a lot of time spent practicing. Meanwhile, my friends would be like outside, like playing basketball or whatever. So the back room of my house was where the music room was. And I remember them knocking on the window and be like, hey, you coming outside? I'm like, nah, bro, I got another two hours, <laughs> you know? So it was exciting um, in that way, as well as, you know, just the community in Detroit. We come, you know, Detroit has a super strong music and arts community. So just being a part of all of that and being in the mix with all of that was great. It is kind of interesting when you think about it to be a west side of Detroit kid playing classical piano. Yeah. How did you make that connection? Okay, well, honestly, I did not make the connection. It's totally my parents, um, their influence. And my mom was like, you know, 
Uh, I want to teach my children discipline. So it was through the piano that um, she taught us discipline. And we had lessons every Saturday or makeup lessons every Wednesday. Like it was a consistent thing. So um, that was just kind of the vehicle for her to teach us uh, discipline. But I ended up falling in love. So. What is it about the piano that you love so much? That is a great question. No one's asked me that one. Yeah, I think the thing that I love most is that it's the voice. It's it's my other voice. Like I have my own like human voice, but I feel that I speak almost better through this other voice. And this voice has no words, but it just can tell emotions. It can t it can paint pictures. Um, it can tell stories. So I just feel like. Um, you know, it's my connection to the universe. And I feel like that's a very strong, very powerful thing. And uh, it's to be respected. And I think that's the thing that I love about the piano. This instrument is incredible. It's so relevant. It's, it's on everything and it's in everything. And uh, I think it just gives it a different twist and a different way of uh, viewing the piano. What is truth? Yeah, what is truth? It is the new single from my new album and it just is a prompt, it's a question that I think we should all ask ourselves, especially considering that we live in a time where um, cognitive dissonance is everywhere. We don't know what's the truth from what we see on the news or, or what we see on our social media. So I think it's a time that we all need to take a step back and ask that question and really, really examine what does it mean personally to each one of us. Um, yeah, and that's kind of like, you know, the the whole seasoning of the song, What is Truth. How do you think that people like you, who you're obviously like younger, hipper, cuter than most mm -hmm. Beethoven-esque types, right. are kind of humanizing and making piano more palatable to a younger audience? Well, my whole goal here is to be the entrance ramp, to be the entrance ramp for people who are non-traditional classical listeners. If you don't normally do it, the idea is you see someone like me, you can relate to like, oh, that guy's just like us. And then it'll say, well, what is he doing? And then you get a chance to listen and hear what I'm doing. And then you become a fan. I mean, you know, I think classical music has had a long history with uh, black people or people of color. And a lot of it because of what classical music is has been buried. A lot of the information, a lot of the people who are extreme creators like uh, Chevalier or like uh, Florence Price, these names, we don't know these names as much as we know Mozart or Chopin, but these names were just as significant, you know? And I believe that we as uh, creators um, or African-American creators um, have a place in this music. And I think that we've always have, and I think it's time that, you know, it becomes hip and fresh and new and young and it's spirited again, you know, and it talks about the things that are going on in our time as opposed to something that was going on, you know, maybe 200, 300 years ago. Well, Bach definitely brings a new approach to cultural relevance. Detroit is the birthplace of many things, and on that list, electric dance music, otherwise known as techno. The funky soul that pulsated through automatic beats was given its rhythm from Detroit, but its futurism and optimism was the influence of black Detroit. First of all, Submerged Management is like our uh, parent company, which oversees Exhibit 3000, which I'm standing in now, where we are now, which is the only techno museum in the world. Somewhere in Detroit is our record store, uh, which we have located in the basement, as well as studios, exhibit spaces, conference rooms for community use. So we're like ambassadors for the city of Detroit. Our city is rebounding, and techno was created in Detroit by four African-American men. These are the four founders of techno, Juan Atkins in the middle here is considered the godfather of techno. He was the first. Derek May, Eddie Folks, and Kevin Saunderson. Juan Atkins was with a group called Cybertron, which recorded a record, Alleys of Your Mind, released in 1981, which was the very first techno record. And one of the primary things is 
educate people about the music uh, which started here and has gone around the world and in any country you go to Detroit techno is being played. You know, when they were creating this genre, did they think, well, this is something special that is gonna take over the world? You don't really know what's going to happen. It may become big and maybe not. You know, it was just something special about this music that attracted people's attention and people got into it, because it was, it was something different. And I think it maybe appealed to a more progressive crowd of people initially, and learning that how black people can work collectively together to create something that's very useful to the community and to the world and to us and to be very, very proud of what we developed and created. There is no limit to the creativity that Detroit can produce. Stay with us. After the break, we take a trip to the slums that birthed an iconic Detroit group. Welcome back. Though hip-hop was birthed in New York City in the 70s, its origins of drum beats and record scratches took new form when it came to Detroit. Over the years, the D has become an epicenter for hip-hop. It's artists working to leave their mark on the industry that heavily focuses on East Coast versus West Coast. However, a group birthed from the slums came on the scene in the late 90s and through its lyricism and underground sound was able to pioneer a new era in hip hop. Slum Village has been named one of Billboard's greatest rap groups of all time. And as they tell us, they're just getting started. Uh, Slum Village came to be Late 80s, early 92, we met in high school. Actually, we met in high school, so I would say 90s. I graduated in 93 at Persian High School, so we got together, I heard about the guys, and they heard about me, and we did this big cypher thing. I, I grew up as a only child, you know, my mom passed when I was 17 from cancer, then I had to move around, I had to I just wanted a better life. That's kind of my, my motivation. I mean, we had drug dealers on the, on the corners over here. You had people doing this and doing that. But we had each other, so the music just kept us tight. The core of Slum Village got together after we got, after we were about to get signed to Hoops, Hoops Records. And, um, and that's what his dad was there. So my parents did music in the 80s, so the beginning part of my childhood was spent on the road, tour bus, uh, name of that group was RJ's latest arrival. So around that time it would be like Fresh Fest time when they was touring with them and Houdini and all of them. And then it got a little normal when they retired and they decided to open up the studio. Him and John Sally, they decided to form a, a, a record company slash studio and they were signing a bunch of artists and we were one of the artists to get signed. And just before we got signed, we wanted to bring by 10 back into the fold, so that's when the core of Slum Village got together. We recorded some records, and then, you know, it was history after that. We didn't, unfortunately, we didn't get the deal for a lot of reasons, and, and then we didn't get signed again to 10 years later. Even, look, even when they was alive and they left the group, they was, people was telling me to hang it up. So people always gonna say that. But, but the actual members that were in the group they told me to keep it going. So, from Dilla and Batin. So they both wanted me to keep it going, whether they was here or a part of it or not. I was appreciative uh, just to be in, in the thoughts, in the runnings to even do it. Uh, uh, it's like my big brothers. I've been knowing them since I was five, six years old. So it was just like, helping them get to where they wanted to go, I was helping myself. So anything I could do to continue the legacy moving forward, you know, was always in my best interest. And I just wanted to see it keep going because we worked so hard to get it to a certain point. With with us, let's just say you got you got Jay Dilla. He's, he's kind of the foundation of, of it in a sense that he showed me how to produce and make beats and doing stuff. I was I already came up with my own rhyme style, but he showed me how to produce. And then he showed Jay how to produce. And anybody who's kind of been in the group has has somewhat of you know that that teaching. So it was always a steady, it was no like outsiders. Everybody had been around. It's it's, it's so we all know what's up. So that's that's why we was able to keep it so consistent. You know what I'm saying? Because the basic of the music is is the music. And then what 
what we saying on top of it. You know what I'm saying? And we and we was able to keep that vibe going. We we're we're known as a soulful group, but the lyrics have always been gritty and kind of grimy. So that's what Detroit gives us. We grew up and and uh, we wasn't it wasn't a nice it wasn't a nice guy path when it came to that because. It was about the grid of Detroit and just growing up in the streets. Uh, the future of Slum Village, we got a lot of things on the table. I'm excited about a lot of things. We got a collaborative, we got a shoe coming out with Puma. We got um, an album coming, untitled, but it's coming August, hopefully. So for a lot of kids now who want to be the next um, Slum Village, what is your advice for them? Um, I would say be consistent with your music. Uh, try to do something different and out the box. That's the base of it. Not, not even the, the step by step, but that is the base. I would say, please bring something new to the table, to the hip hop table. We don't need anything that's that's a copycat. It's, and there's a lot of copycats out there. Um, that's number one. Number two, I would say, um, you have to build some a team. I know people say that. That sounds cliche when you say, yeah, my team, my, you know, but a team helps. When I came up, I had a group of friends. That was my team. And we all had positions that we took to build and help Slum Village get to where we at. Pick your partner wisely. Because it's just like picking a wife. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you at, attached to the hip with this person. And the, and the goal is not to do something partially, it's to go the distance. So, you know, make sure y'all on sync with where y'all see things going. Make sure y'all checking in with each other to make sure y'all still on the same page with the direction you want the group to go. And like he said, you know, trust that core people that you have around you, whether it's family that you're getting your advice from on what you should be doing, or whether it's the circle of friends that T came up with. So. All right, well, we are not the only ones getting in on celebrating hip hop as it turns 50. This year, the BET Awards dedicated its show to the iconic genre, paying tribute to everything and everyone that helped build hip hop. Performances included Dougie Fresh, Kid and Play, 69 Boys, Trick Daddy, and so many others whose iconic bars left a mark on that genre. 2023 Lifetime Achievement Award presented by Sprite goes to the Don Dada, the Don Dada, the Don 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 Dada, Buster Rhymes. Whoa, 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 whoa. 12 time Grammy Award nominated Buster Rhymes took home the night's biggest award. Known for his tongue tying lyrics and quick delivery on his most famous record, Break Your Neck, he clocks an impressive nine words per second. He got choked up during his speech, using it to encourage love in the genre and urging rappers not to fight. Well, we are excited to see what the next 50 years holds for hip hop. Coming up, we explore a genre that is truly synonymous with Detroit. And that's Motown. We talk with some of the biggest stars about how the genre came about. You don't want to miss it. Stay with us. Motown, Hitsville, all have become synonymous with Detroit because of one man. Of course, I'm talking about Barry Gordy. The famed record executive began his label in the late 1950s, giving birth to a time and a sound like no other. Motown became the home to some of the biggest groups and artists of all time. So we begin our look at Motown's history by dancing in the street with Martha Reeves. I was born in Alabama, New Fall, Alabama. I was brought here when I was 18 months old. Moved on Illinois, right off of Ryerville, around the place where we danced in the street. My grandfather was a Methodist minister and I've been in church all my life. Uh, my, I sang with my two brothers, Benny and, and Thomas. Where was the church? Uh, it was at uh, Du Bois in Leland. It's now defunct, just like my schools, Northeastern High School and Miller High School. They all torn down now. You know that Ray Charles was a blues singer, but he also came from the church. Mm -hmm. A lot of his songs, he was indicated, like uh, they said, he took gospel songs and turned them into R&B, which is the, the truth. The so did Motown. Most of the songs that I sang were gospel songs. Jimmy Mack, when are you coming back? Jesus Christ, when are you coming back? Yeah, I was going to ask that. Mm -hmm. Who is Jimmy? He's Jesus. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. And uh, love is like a heat wave. That's the Holy Spirit. It hits you from the top of your head to the tips of your toes. That's the only heat wave I've ever, ever experienced. What was it like to be a Motown artist? 
it was like going to a daycare center <laughs> with a lot of talented kids. Wow. A lot of talented people. Barry kind of had a way of uh, collecting the most talented. Well, I came from the Warfield Theater. Mm -hmm. I had everybody uh, that I had spoken to had, a, I had a, actually competed at the Warfield Theater. Uh, my introduction was through Mickey Stevenson, the a and director. Well, his name was William R. Stevenson, but they called him Mickey, and that's who I asked for when I came to the desk that day. Every, every experience has been a lesson of some kind, whether it was a, a painful lesson or it was an enhancing lesson. So Motown's music made you an ambassador. You went all over the world singing their music, and it didn't have a name or a race or a, 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 a ethnic group or an age or a generation or anything. This music made the very good they depicted it being the sound of young America, mm -hmm. and it became the sound of the world. Can you define the Motown sound? Yeah. It's a bunch of people getting together and relating to love, life, and experiences of joy. It was all about happiness. I don't think there was one song that was recorded on Motown that would cause anybody any harm or deflate anybody's ego or cause anybody any grief or pain. It was all about bringing uh, love out, get rid of the blues, and making us dance. And that's what the music, the music was recorded for musicians. And us singers had to learn how to sing with it. As a matter of fact, while I was in the studio, most of the time they was, hey, Martha, stay in the pocket, stay in the pocket. Because the rhythms from the drums and the bass and the keyboards and the guitars, you had to get in between there somehow because they all had a space. That's the, the, the secret to the Motown sound. They let everybody have their own space. Do you miss all that hustle and bustle? Do you miss those days? It was not hustle and bustle. It was, it was, uh, Fellowship, that's what it was. I miss being with the wonderful people making that music. There are very few places you can go now where people are in one accord like they were at Hipsville. Uh, all these good looking men, they had two of the women. Yeah, they had a wife at home and a singer and they had other performer. And um, I became a, a good secretary in that department while I was getting my chance to record my chance to be a star. And when we left for our first tour, 94 one-nighters, uh, three months of being on the road in this broken down trailway bus, everybody's song had charted by the time we got back those three months. But coming out of that studio and getting on that bus, and riding with those 12 acts in the 12 piece band and singing our songs from uh, Detroit to New York, from New York to Washington, D.C., from Washington, D.C. to Chicago, to Chicago, to Seattle, Washington, and Los Angeles, California, and then coming back around to Colorado, and Texas, and uh, back to History of USA, and everybody's records had charted. Barry was very clever to send us on that three-month excursion. Clever indeed. What a legacy. Well, we continue our Motown history with an absolute miracle. Stay tuned. One of the country's biggest artists has a career that spans over four decades, and it all began here at Hitsville. Smokey Robinson started his group, The Miracles, while still in high school, and they dominated R&B for years before he went solo. Smokey's influence on music cannot be denied. Here now with you, the amazing, wonderful, legendary Smokey Robinson. Thank you again for making so much time for CBS Detroit. We really appreciate you. Well, Amir, I appreciate you doing this. Like I said, I, I really thank you for doing this. And, you know, you're doing it in Detroit, which is my hometown, so it makes it extra special. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's what I wanted to talk about first, Smokey Joe. What was life like for you right. growing up in <laughs> All right, Detroit? take me back. <laughs> oh, yeah, honey, I did my research. I know you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so what was life like for you growing up here in Detroit? Oh, life was great. I mean, I grew up in the hood, man. But you see, I, I had no idea that we were in the hood or how poor we were, any of that. 
because it was my situation and that was where I lived and everybody was under the same conditions. So the, was your first group that you started uh, long before Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, the Five Chimes? Yeah. Yeah, and how did we transition five. from that to the other? Well, well, the Five Chimes, you know, uh, I, I probably was about a, a 11. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the guys who ended up being in the Miracles also, a guy named Ron White, he was the paper boy on our street. Ron's cousin uh, told us that Jackie Wilson's managers were in town and they were auditioning for talent. We sang the five songs and they told us that we would never make it. But just so happens that day, I tell everybody it was a God day because that day, Barry Gordy was there and that's where we got the songs from. I told him I had written them. He wanted to hear some more of my songs. He and I struck up a relationship and about uh, a year and a half or so after that, he started Motown. And uh, we had a record called Bad Girl. And it was really doing great because we were just local at the time. We were just in Detroit and Flint and Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, the record broke out so big in those areas, we wanted national distribution. So Barry took it and put it with Chess in Chicago. And I think the influence from Motown is, is so great. And with you uh, being there and being so multifaceted as both a performer and a songwriter, how would you describe the Motown sound? It's, you know, it's been a long time since somebody asked me that question uh, because they used to ask that uh, people talked about it because there were so many versions out in the streets of what the Motown sound was. Well, it's got more kick drum. No, it's got more piano. No, the drums above the... the all that. I tell people all the time, and they, and they said, okay, when we, when, we, when we really started making a lot of hits in a row, honey, people were coming from uh, London and Africa and New York and Chicago and California and Nashville and everywhere to Detroit to record their artists because they thought the Motown sound was in the air. If you come to Detroit and record your artist, you're going to get the Motown sound because it's in the air, okay? <laughs> we always got the Motown sound because we are the Motown sound. Yeah, the amen. people, the artists, we're the Motown sound. We're the ones, the producers, the writers, the people behind the scenes. We are the Motown sound. You know, Detroit, when I, when, when I was a kid, when I really called it Detroit, it was the Motor City. Now it's called Motown. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's really, really wonderful. And we uh, the first instance I can give you of something like that was, you know, back when I was growing up, honey, if you were black and you were in Dearborn or Gross Point or or uh, uh, any of those cities like that, uh, Bloomfield Hills or anywhere like that, if you were black and you were in one of those areas, mm -hmm. you better have something on you that says you're working for somebody who lives there. The segregation was powerful. It was it was like that. We started Motown. About a year after we had been in business, like I said, we were still local. And we were getting letters from the white kids in those areas. Hey man, we heard your music. We love your music. A year or so after we started getting letters from them, we started getting letters from their parents. Hey, we found out our kids were listening to your music secretly. We want to know what they were listening to. So we listened to it. We love your music. We are glad that our kids have access to your music. So we start to break down barriers like that with music. Dr. Martin Luther King came and he said, uh, I, I want to record my I Have a Dream speech on Motown. Mm -hmm. Because of the fact that you guys are doing with music what I'm trying to do politically and legally. I'm trying to bring people together. For you, Mr. Robinson, so much more so than a lot of the other Motown artists, you can put some pretty provocative things in your lyrics, but you say it so beautifully, sometimes people don't quite catch on. For example, now more current, what is an eyegasm? An eyegasm is a good feeling through your eyes, through sight. <laughs> when you see somebody or you see something, that's what it is. It's, 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 it makes, makes you feel good just seeing them or seeing it. So uh, that's an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very politically correct answer, and I like it. <laughs> so tell me about this new album and all that has gone into it. Well, uh, you know, I've been working on it for about five years, and um, I, I, I didn't have the song Gasms until, you know, recently, about a, a year or so ago. 
and I was at the piano and I was just trying to think of something because I wanted, it had been a long time since I had had out an album of original material, new original material. And so uh, I, I was working on it and I wanted to have controversy. So I thought about what is controversial in today's world? It's hard to find something controversial in today's world because anything goes, you know. So, but anyway, I, I thought about gasms and I thought about it and said, well, you know, that's a controversial word. And when you hear gasms, the first thought that comes to the, in most people's minds is orgasm. Well, that's a well, gasm. Ooh, gasm. But gasms is any good feeling. Because I looked it up before I completed the song. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's any good feeling you might have from anything that might give you that good feeling. All the songs basically have that kind of connotation. That kind of feel to it. So when can yeah. uh, your hometown crowd expect to hear all this from you directly? When are you coming home? Oh, God. Hold on. Can you hold on one second? I'm going to tell you exactly. Yes, sir. I sure coming. can. August 5th, coming August 5th to the Fox Theater. And I cannot tell you how I'm anticipating that. I, I can't wait. You know, the Fox Theater, we ended up doing all the Motortown reviews at the Fox Theater when we were, when we were doing, when we were still in Detroit and we were doing the Motortown reviews. We did them at the Fox Theater. So the Fox Theater is very near and dear to my heart. So, I'm, you know, it's like coming home to Detroit. I love coming here to perform anyway because it's my home. Yeah. But we're going to be at the Fox Theater, man. I haven't played the Fox Theater in probably 40 years. <laughs> you know? Oh, so yes. It's been, I, it hasn't changed much, that. though. <laughs> it really hasn't. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sure everyone's going to be very excited to have you back, myself included. Anything that you would like to say to all of your viewers and listeners out there? Oh, yeah. I, I, first of all, I love you guys. And thank you for being interested in what I'm doing with my life. And Amir, I thank you for doing this, sweetheart. Well, that was an absolute bucket list moment to interview Smokey Robinson. We have really enjoyed putting the spotlight on genres with unique Detroit feels for this Black Music Month. You can find all of these stories and more on our website, cbsdetroit.com. Thanks so much for joining us.